Yo, what's good, YouTube? It's your boy Des Reacts back with another video. In this one, we got SAS Jungle Rescue Operation Barra's full documentary in HD from the History Channel. Um, this one was pretty, you know, highly recommended. Um, I don't know nothing about it. I never seen this. I don't know what this is, but I know it's the SAS. We know how those boys get down. So I'm super excited for this one. Um, appreciate all the love and support on the uh, latest videos. If you haven't, please smash that sub button, smash that like button. And by the way, this is part one to this, all right? So I got part two locked and loaded, ready to go as soon as the this video um, hits a certain amount of likes. So be sure to smash that like button. Um, and another thing is I'm gonna start pinning the first comments on my videos, you know, what, no matter what your uh, opinion is, I'm gonna uh, pin it for you, all right? So be sure to be that first comment. And yeah, let's get it. Operation Bears. It's a true story. A British patrol takes a wrong turn in Sierra Leone. 12 soldiers are kidnapped by drug crazed rebels. The hostages must do all they can to stay alive until special forces launch one of the most daring rescue missions of modern times. Worst case scenario, they shoot the hostages and then also manage to take out one of the helicopters. The attack force will need luck, skill and bravery. The raid could change an entire African nation or become a British Black Hawk Down. This is finna be good, man. Buckle down, get your popcorn. This is gonna be good. Oh man, they said a British Black Hawk Down. If you guys don't know, for some reason, um, yeah, Black Hawk Down was was crazy. You know, U.S. forces, U.S. Rangers, I believe it was, got the helicopter shot down in Somalia. It was embarrassing for the government, and like, yeah, they tried to capture their body. It's a it's a good movie too. You should check it out, Black Hawk Down. But this is about to be good. West Africa, Sierra Leone. Elite British soldiers burst into action 5,000 kilometers from home. Then, disaster strikes. There was a massive explosion. Then the cries and the screams. They must take control. If their rescue mission fails, they will be slaughtered in this heart of darkness. Sierra Leone looks like a tropical paradise. It has fertile soil and vast mineral wealth. But in the year 2000, it is officially the world's poorest nation and the most dangerous. Whole, oh, just look at that, man. Be, you know, no matter what, guys. It is officially the world's. Be grateful where you come from, right? If you're from a first world country, you know, be grateful. Guess thank your governments, your military, whatever you got to do, because that's what the least poor, you know, the most poor country in the world looks like, man. That's sad. People have to live in that type of conditions. Whoa, that looks rough. You got, what is that, dog and cats running with pigs and stuff? Like what? It's poorest nation. And the most dangerous. Got a little baby standing in garbage. Life expectancy for a man is just 36. The cause is a savage civil war between the government and powerful rebel militias. 75,000 people have died over the last nine years. August 25th, a patrol of 11 Royal Irish Rangers returns to base near the capital city, Freetown. 
Major Alan Marshall is in command. You're right, lads. Marshall and his men are here because Sierra Leone is a former British colony. And Britain is determined to stop the country descending into anarchy. Okay, yeah, and uh, if I believe I'm right, British actually colonized quite a bit of Africa, right? So is there countries that they conquered, or not necessarily conquered, but colonized and then pulled completely out of? All right, let me know in the comments. Four months ago, rebels were about to seize Freetown. United Nations peacekeepers were in disarray. Britain sent a task force to defend the city, followed by 200 Royal Irish Rangers to train the Sierra Leonean army and help it defeat the rebels. Come to play, come to shoot. Lieutenant Musa Bangura is one of the best soldiers to complete the training program. Musa is the patrol's local liaison officer. He's liked and respected by the rangers, and they can't operate here without him. I used to guide them and act as interpreter. The British people actually knew very little at that time about the people of this country, customs and the politics. Musa has warned the rangers about the savage brutality of the rebels. Yeah, and even in like in Iraq, Afghanistan, those interpreters, you know, locals that fought alongside the, you know, the coalition forces, like they were extremely useful and, you know, a lot of the people liked them, right? Like a lot of the, our soldiers, because, I mean, they're well respected and they could get you out of certain situations, I'm sure. Especially their weapon of terror, amputation. They thought that if they carry out amputation, civilians will support them, they will fear them, and if they fear them, they definitely have to support them. There are thousands of victims across the country. What could that little girl have done, man? Gosh. The rebels have no political ideology. Their main aim is to seize the country's diamond mines. Every year, the mines produce gems worth up to 100 million US dollars. In rebel hands, these are blood diamonds, tainted by human suffering. But they hold another dark secret. Many rebels trade them with Al-Qaeda in exchange for weapons. Osama bin Laden's agents then sell the stones to fund global terrorism. The patrol passes through the Okra Hills on the west side of the country. The dense jungle here is controlled by a notorious rebel group. Their headquarters is less than six kilometers away. They call themselves the West Side Boys. Hold on, let me go ahead and make sure I got my highest settings on. I do. The 300 strong gang includes escaped criminals, women, and boys forced to arms. They love rap music and outlandish clothing. Some even wear wigs. They also have an insatiable appetite for drink and drugs. For fighters like 23-year-old Turkish, the party usually starts in the afternoon. We don't drink rum. But they get extra mind to do anything. Let me, Commander, tell me. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I know in Africa and stuff, they gave a lot of kids like you know drugs to eat and stuff. So that, like when they fought, you don't care. You know, you're just running out there. That's <clears throat> I feel like that's what a lot of uh, you know Afghanistan people did and Iraqis. Like you know, I'm sure. 
the Taliban, they got high, got drunk, you know, before they do this. Because think about it, their training and stuff is not like, you know, the Western, you know, Western forces and stuff. So they got to rely more on courage than they do their skills, I guess. So man, then they smoke brown brown. They can, me now, so, and I jump on them, I can smoke. Their leader is 24-year-old Fode Kale. Despite the partying, he has a problem. He and many of his group are renegade soldiers. In 1997, they staged a bloody coup. But the junta collapsed a year later, and the government returned to power. The mutineers fled into the jungle and formed the West Side Boys. Now they're politically sidelined, and surrounded by government and UN forces. If they leave the jungle, they could be charged with treason and war crimes. At that time, we fear. We fear that if we give the gun, we'll be arrested and sent to prison. It's a catch-22 situation, and Calais will do anything to find a way out. 1.45 p.m. The patrol stops at a UN checkpoint. What do you know about the villages up ahead here? The soldiers tell Marshall about some villages in West Side Boy territory. There's a rumor that some of the rebels are willing to risk surrender. Marshall has orders to gather intelligence on hostile forces in the area. He decides to investigate. Musa is uneasy about the change of plan. The jungle gets thicker. I said, what this area you? is infested with West Side Boys. They will not take it lightly if they happen to see us. But there is also a personal reason for Musa's anxiety. Hold your feet, hold your feet. He knows many of the rebels are former comrades from the Sierra Leonean army. Now as mutineers, they hate him and all serving officers. They wanted all of us to support them. But because we did not do that, they taught us as traitors. The West Side boys watch as the British patrol drives into their heartland. They send a decoy team to stop the convoy. Then, an ambush party swarms from the shadows. They started shouting that if you shoot, we are going to kill you all. The rebels grab Marshall. The leader of the mob steps forward. The patrol has strayed deep into West Side Boy territory. No one here is about to surrender. Anything could happen. Damn. Bro, that's tough, man. You know that you're about to, you know, your local guy that gets nervous, right? Because he knows all these dudes. He knows it's their territory. Jungle's getting thicker. Air is probably getting thicker. You know, you just, your anxiety's ramping up because this dude's scared. And even though you're locked in, right? Because you're a trained soldier, but even trained soldiers get scared, I promise you. And then you just go into an ambush and there's nothing you can do because they all, you know, they don't care. They don't got rules of engagement. They'll kill you if they have to, right? So, I mean... Just think about what they're going through right now in this situation. Like their hearts are pounding. They're probably sick to their stomachs. Life flashing before their eyes. Think about their families, you know. Only one uh, mission now, you know, stay alive and wait for help. Musa can see the patrol is heavily outnumbered. 
and the rebels are well armed with AK-47 assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades. Diplomacy is Major Marshall's only option. All right, lads. Lower your weapons. The rebels aren't impressed. This is a British patrol, a routine patrol. <laughs> They strip weapons and valuables from the Rangers in the first two vehicles. Then they turn to the third vehicle. And there's a chilling moment of recognition. Uh-oh. Musa served with this man before the mutiny. He knew me personally and I knew him personally. Now, the renegade soldier has a grudge to settle because Musa stayed loyal to the army. It's payback time. I thought well, they would bring a knife, behead me, or just shoot me like that. The rest of the patrol fear they could be next in line for the same treatment. Or something worse. When Musa regains consciousness, the West Side boys are taking the patrol deeper into the jungle. Late that afternoon, they arrive at the rebels' stronghold, a tiny village called Gaberi Bana. Rebel leader Fode Kale sees the 12 men as hostile intruders. I'm not the one who gave the order to arrest them, but my men arrest them and hand over them to me. They don't have any business to go right in the jungle. I take them as a spy. He knows the British soldiers will be invaluable bargaining chips. As hostages, they'll give the West Side boys power and maybe a way out of the jungle. Stop! Oh, that's right, because the UN is confining them to, you know, inside the jungle. If they leave the jungle, they're going to get arrested or killed, right? So, very interesting. Let's see what happens. 50 kilometers away, in Freetown, senior officers from the Royal Irish Rangers enjoy a drink. An urgent message arrives. Twelve men are missing. A chill runs through Lieutenant Colonel Simon Fordham, the regiment's commanding officer in Sierra Leone. We surmised that they had had an accident, or the worst case would be that somehow they had been, uh, they got involved with the West Side Boys or been apprehended by them. The British commanders immediately plan a full-scale search. But Musa fears his time is already running out. And he's right to think that, right? Because here you go, here you are. You just uh, kidnap some rangers from the Brits, right? So they're going to send in their special forces guys if they have them available. And he knows. I mean, them boys don't play. So, Major Alan Marshall, this is a real messy situation. These guys might kill me any time from now. I am not important to them. I'm not going to be a bargaining chip. Maybe my days are over. Minutes later, the rebels drag him away. <laughs> He's beaten again. This time, by boy soldiers. He's getting beaten by little kids. Little kids that the adults in the group are leading to their death. It's a cruel world out there. I was feeling the pain, every pain, because you are beating me everywhere. My head, my eyes, my everywhere. 
he's thrown into an old cesspit. His cell is two meters deep and about five meters square. The stench is unbearable. There's nothing to drink. Day two, August 26th. The British begin their search for the missing patrol at dawn, but they call it off when Calais announces he is holding the patrol hostage. He has a list of demands. Among them, he wants an amnesty and recognition for the West Side boys, not as criminals, but as a political force. They also insist on the release of West Side commanders captured by the government. The demands weren't realistic. There's no way that they were going to be met whatsoever. These demands were a way that he was hoping that could get them out of the jungle. If they stayed in the jungle, they could see no future apart from carrying on a criminal lifestyle for which they would probably end up dead. Later that day, Calais tells his hostages he started okay. negotiations. We will negotiate, then you'll be released. He seems okay. calm and reasonable. Where is Musa? Shut up! But his volatile character emerges seconds later. Kalina, bad man. I'm a prisoner. Okay. Okay. He gets bad man. Okay. For years, he open unexpected. Marshall Rear. Yeah, so Biden is a therapist. Hot headed, quick tempered, in control of a bunch of dudes on drugs with alcohol and guns. What's the worst that can happen? Isis Calais could fly into a rage or execute the hostages. He fears negotiations are doomed. Their only hope is a military rescue. Somehow, they must smuggle information about where they're being held to the outside world. All they have is a pen and a scrap of paper. They begin drawing a map of Gaberi Bana, revealing the exact location of the hostage house and rebel defenses. Whoa. That's so smart, man. That's where training probably just kicks in for you, right? Like, backs against the wall, got no other options but to just, they're just making a map and, you know, praying for a miracle to happen. If someone will retrieve information, you know, or if, I don't know, it's crazy. The British military also thinks negotiations will fail and is preparing a massive rescue mission. It is codenamed Operation Barris and will be led by Britain's Special Air Service, or SAS. Television cameras captured their ruthless efficiency in 1980. The world watched as the SAS freed 19 hostages held by terrorists at the Iranian embassy in London. Five of the six terrorists died. There were no SAS casualties. And if you guys don't know, I reacted to that exact one. I don't know if it was the live footage or not, but I, I reacted to that, man. Go check it out. That, that story was crazy, man. Operation Barris will take days to organize. The hostages may not survive this long. The slightest thing could set the West Side boys off. Yeah, they were completely rational. Four days into the crisis, the rebels seem tired of negotiation. The hostages are lined up. You're going to be the first one to die. And you second. They fear executions are about to begin. And you third. Minutes pass. But nothing happens. 
except the arrival of palm wine. I already know what's gonna happen. They're gonna get drunk as hell. Somebody's gonna slip up, they're gonna get that information out somehow. The hostages are spared simply because the West Side boys no longer have killing in mind. British officers and UN officials are still locked in negotiations tonight. The world's media reports that negotiations are underway. Unaware that in reality, the hostages' lives are on a knife edge. Day 5, August the 29th, 4.30 p.m. Lieutenant Colonel Simon Fordham, the Royal Irish Rangers commanding officer, meets the rebels at the edge of the jungle. It was a very dangerous situation. Most of them were drunk or high on drugs for the vast majority of the time. Calais brings Marshal and Captain Laverty to prove the hostages are alive. Laverty's heart is pounding. Hidden in his hand is the map of the rebel stronghold. He has one chance to pass it to Fordham. Oh, oh, so smart. They wait until they got negotiated. Man. If the rebels suspect they are being tricked, they could kill all the hostages. He came forward, shook my hand, and as he shook my hand, there was clearly something in it. Laverty is pulled away, but no one has spotted his sleight of hand. But really, the point of these negotiations were to gain time. With a vested interest, clearly, if getting the patrol out at each and every stage. Okay, so is the UK's policy... I think it is, actually. Because you guys had that one girl that was around during the embassy raid. So I'm assuming you guys don't negotiate with terrorists either, the UK, because I know obviously the USA don't. So I mean, oh, that's interesting. And I'm assuming these dudes are considered terrorists, right? Like they kill their own people. They, you know, civil war, terroristic stuff. Well, they told me that let me release the men. Then they will go and meet the government and talk to them. Kelly was out of control. Uh, he ranted on with a series of demands which he would hope would get him out of the jungle. The rebel leader wants an amnesty and political recognition for the West Side boys. But then he surprises everyone. I may release some of your prisoners. He says he will release five hostages in exchange for a satellite phone. Calais wants the phone to contact the BBC, I need a satellite phone. so his demands reach a world audience. We go right to the international community, because at that time the government was so stubborn that we never listened to us. Calais departs, unaware the British have more than the imminent release of five hostages to celebrate. They now have a detailed map of Gaberi Bana. The following day, the British send Calais a satellite phone. That's very smart. Guaranteed five out, sends him a phone, and then you have like, you know, half the hostages left, right? So, I mean, yeah, no, this is pretty wild. It's pretty wild, but I, I'm assuming that it's not gonna go as planned. And five rangers walk free. <clears throat> oh, Their accounts of beating and mock execution strengthen the case for action. The seven remaining hostages must be freed. It was pretty clear that we were going to have to do a rescue operation as quickly as possible. While the BBC broadcasts the demands Calais makes on his new satellite phone, the SAS arrive in Freetown. For security reasons, all SAS operations are covered by an official secrets act. These are the words of a real SAS soldier. To guarantee his anonymity, they are spoken by an actor. 
You look forward to it. It's what you're trained for, it's what you're good at, it's what you do. If you don't enjoy it, you're in the wrong game. It's the excitement, it's the buzz. The SAS are joined by a 147 strong contingent from the Crack Parachute Regiment. The combined assault force is stationed at Waterloo Camp on the outskirts of Freetown. Wow. The SAS need detailed information about their target. They send observation teams to explore the terrain and spy on the West Side boys. And that's going to do it for part one, y'all. If you guys enjoyed it, please smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And let me know in the comments how you feel about this, you know, and what you think. And let me know if you guys want part two. Catch you guys on the next video. Peace.